Welcome, you are listening to the Travel Wind. Welcome, you are listening to the Travel Winds, hosted by Pete Kotzbach. This is a weekly interview show about people who travel for work and all the ups and downs that go along with it. Each episode includes a variety of discussions with athletes, business people, musicians, influencers, entertainers, and even regular folks from around the world. Thanks for listening. Here we go. Hey, welcome to the show. Today, my guest is Joaquin McKinney, McWinney, excuse me, also known as Kino. Uh, I'll use Kino. I like that. I like it. Oh, yeah. Lead singer of a reggae band, Big Mountain, based out of San Diego, now in Sonata, maybe, right? So Yeah. That officially, I live I live in both places. Yeah, yeah. Well, and I'm super excited. He's actually in Bali, Indonesia right now. So that's... Uh, I, I am. not talked to anybody in Bali yet. So this is pretty awesome. How are you doing today, buddy? It's a nice place. I'm doing good, you know? I'm, I'm really enjoying my trip. I took advantage of uh, being in this sort of, uh, what would you call it? Just tranquil environment. Yeah. I've been I've been uh, indulging in the yoga and- The papaya. Trying, <laughs> the papaya. Jumping on the meditation horse again, uh, probably go. for the 1,000th time in my life. And, uh, and, I, and I'm not doing too bad. I'm actually really impressed. Well, that's good. I, I it's interesting. I, I started uh, doing meditation when I go to sleep. My wife and I about six uh, six months ago, I guess. So it's, okay, it kind of helps, you know. Just especially when I'm on, when I'm traveling, and I'm on the road. I I just put in the earbuds. I'm just uh, relax. You know, at some point, I think we we realize that uh, life is never going to be perfect. You're never going to be in a situation where you can't have. 50 million things and stress going through your mind. So yeah. you just say, you know, uh, that's the beautiful thing about growing old and, you know, and, and having experience in this life because yeah. you have to succumb to, you know, the pressure and, and, and how many issues we deal with on a daily basis. Right. And, yeah. and, uh, and it, there's, it, 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 it kind of gives you no choice, but to say, just let go. Let go. Stop. Stop that. Thinking about all the fifty million things that yeah. you got to deal with, and and be one with the universe. And it, it really does help. It takes, you know, it takes time. It takes like about, I'd say for me about a good eight ten minutes before I really start to get into a yeah. a mode of, you know, just. I guess ha having a pleasant outlook, you know, and, and, and all of the little things that we deal with as human beings, right? The little jealousy, the envy, and why am I in the situation that I'm in? You know, I should yeah. be doing better, or I should be this, I should be that. And you just, hey, you are who you are, man. Um, you're right where you're supposed it. to be. You're right where you're supposed to be. And, and just ap appreciate the fact that... Uh, that you got a roof over your head and, and you're, you know, the, 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 the most important things, right. Your family is safe. Yeah. And, um, and so, yeah, yeah, it's, uh, but it, it, it's good. It really, really is, is good, but it, it, it takes you just paying attention. Yeah. It's a good word. For, uh, that's, that's actually really nice. You know, I, I was wondering if you went to Bali to kind of decompress after the tour, yeah, you, know, you just toured with Maxi Priest, the original Whalers, and UB40. And you had mentioned before we recorded that it was your first tour in, in a while. So, yeah. you know, you get done with the tour and all of a sudden you get to go. <laughs> How was that? I wish. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I wish. There, there, there's, there, right now, I, I, uh, I'm not in a position to really take a vacation. Um, you know, things are, things are, are, are good right now. Um, and so I'm not complaining, but it, I, I feel like, uh, I really can't turn down work right now. You know what I mean? I, yeah. I, uh, I'm setting things up. Um, and it's, it's exciting because right now I'm pretty much booked up until April okay. and, um, uh, and it's what we just got through with this global pandemic. So yeah. after that whole experience, um, 
you know, I, I we, we, we're coming out of this. You and I are, are from the same generation, right? Yep. Absolutely. And I, I kind of feel like this is the first time in a long time where I felt in control. Yeah. And, um, and, and being able to psychologically put everything in their compartments. Right. You know, it, oh, it, yeah. Yeah. It hasn't been, it hasn't been easy for me to do that. Um, in my life, as far as my, my per perspective and my experience. So I'm appreciating the fact that, um, you know, I've, I've got work and now it's like, yeah. all right, Kino, well, what's most health. important? Stay yeah. healthy. And uh, well, you said the key thing, most important. Yeah. Stay healthy, stay functional and, and, you know, keep working for as long as you can. It's, yeah. Yeah, man. It's interesting because you know, I'm an outside sales rep. So if, if I'm not out selling and outside, I'm not making money. You know, and then when, so when they shut down all the stores in California, it was like, well, what do I do for money? If the stores aren't open, I can't ship anything. If I don't ship anything, I don't get paid. If I don't get paid, I don't eat. You know, so it was panic. It was like, I'm talking to my wife and I'm like, I don't know what we're going to do. She got laid off. You know, she got wow. shut down. So it was like, and, and but then it worked out right because all of a sudden my my I had two stores that were online sales. Online sales just went through the roof, like it was Christmas. Oh, time. good. And all of a sudden, I was like, okay, we're gonna make enough to get by, you know. And all of a sudden, it got better. And I was like, what's going on? It's like well, it was weird. So it went from panic hey, to when... okay to. And then you know, uh, yeah. I don't know about you, but like for my wife and I, we like, you know, because they shut everything down in California. We're like, when they open up yeah. again. We're going to go see music. We're going to go see comedy. We're going to go to do all the things we couldn't do for those two years, you know, and all the things we, we, we missed. So we've been seeing a lot of concerts lately. Oh, good for you. Yeah. yeah. Good for you. I, I was going to say, you know, when, when one door closes, another is open. You really have to believe in the idea that, okay, well, I can't pay attention to this anymore because it's not really producing fruit, you know? Yeah. You 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 end up uh, shifting your focus around and um and hope that uh, other other opportunities are gonna are gonna open up and um my situation like like you say I had to um, really start working on um, kind of shifting uh, the the profile of my business um, and spending more time working on my solo stuff. Yeah. And working with uh, with bands abroad and just filling in the gaps because I can't, um, you know, Big Mountain has has its seasons. And and when we tour as a band and uh, and when Big Mountain's not busy, I have to stay busy. Yeah. And that was something that I couldn't I couldn't really do before. I really wasn't in the position to do that. And um, so. I'm really enjoying the fact that um, that uh, that I, I took that step. It's a little it, it, it's nerve wracking because I'm working with bands from all over the world. Yeah. Right. Um, but what's really beautiful about this situation is that you end up putting yourself in a situation where you have to. You, you have to get out of your comfort zone. Yeah. Um, you know, I'm not dealing with my guys that I can always depend on. Your and brother on and stage. yeah, yeah, and Pat and and it, yeah, it all, it all, it all happens uh, without a lot of effort. I have to, you know, I have to fly to a place like Bali, and I have to, it, you know, engage in some grueling rehearsals, get everybody up to speed. But in the process of that. I'm able to mingle and really socially connect with people from a completely different culture, from a completely different, yeah. um, you know, part of the world. That's the, the best part about this style of touring for me is having that new perspective and getting to know people and share experiences, share culture, share, Share my knowledge as well, because usually I'm dealing with now I'm dealing with people that are a lot younger than me. <laughs> <laughs> no comment. So, <laughs> so, so I get to um, one learn, you know, because we all we're always going to learn, but I also get to 
share what I've learned about yeah. what it's what what it takes to be a pro and hit the stage looking like a pro and sounding like a pro, right? You know, so for yeah. them it's good, for me it's good. Um, and then I'll, I'll, I'm usually staying in houses also, which is a, which is a, it's just so much better than Not staying bus. in a hotel. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no tour bus and and no hotel. You know, like I'll yeah. stay in hotels a little bit here and there, but um, a lot of times it just makes sense for me to stay with a family, like what I'm doing right now. I'm staying yeah. with the the manager of the band and. And it, you you get immersed. It, it's it's a lot. It's a lot more of a you know what what would I call it? Just an ingrained experience. Sure. Yeah, I was going to ask you. I, I you mentioned earlier that you're going to have a Spanish speaking uh, album or songs. Have you ever incorporated Spanish speaking into the reggae vibe? Yeah, you know it's funny enough from the first album that Big Mountain put out, we, in, in 1992, we released uh, an album called years Wake ago. Up. Yes, 1992. Isn't that crazy? And that was our first album. Yep, it's crazy as hell. <laughs> 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 and our, our big hit on that album was a song called Touch My Light. And um, we did a Spanish version of that song. And it's, you know, I mean, it's just so interesting because I really didn't speak Spanish well back then. Now I'm <laughs> I'm I'm a lot more fluent. Yeah. But I come from Spanish, you know, Mexican roots. My mom is full-blooded Mexican, but born in the United States. My parents, my grandparents uh, were Mexican immigrants. So it just was always so important to me. My grandfather was a musician. I grew up listening to I mean, I, I kind of missed, I mean, I remember watching his band when I was baby baby. But yeah. by the time by the time I was really conscious of what was going on, my uncles had taken over and they were pretty much doing his. They would do his repertoire, which was. All just popular Mexican music from boleros yeah. to rancheras, corridos. It was a blend of all that was just kind of hitting at the time. And and then they would mix in the stuff that they liked as as young American uh, Mexican Americans, right? You know, jazz or, you know, whatever was hitting. You know, disco. It it, it didn't matter. My my uncle <laughs> yeah. Oscar, yeah. who who's the the piano player, and then my uncle Eddie played bass, and they're both, you know, just my my really my endearest, my my greatest influences and 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 mentors in this, and they've always been there for me. My I, I lost my uncle Eddie. Uh, not too long ago, but I but I still have my uncle Oscar with me. So I I you know I said shit, man. Uh, I want to put some Spanish on this album, and, yeah. and I you know I got together with somebody, uh, and we 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 translated the song, and we came up with a cool little version, and it's still it's still hidden today. We did a I did a remake of it uh, about five years ago, and you know it's on the it's on a playlist, uh, Spanish cool. reggae playlist. <laughs> <laughs> in Spotify yeah. and and all over it, 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 it it's a it's a huge it's a huge song you know and uh and funny enough you know years after that Spanish reggae took off so now there's reggae bands in Argentina and yeah. Puerto Rico and this and I mean I'm not trying to toot my own horn uh -oh. but I'm I'm kind of looked at as the pioneer of reggae in Spanish, because of course, with Baby I Love Your Way, we did a Spanish version of Baby yeah. I Love Your Way. And that was the first time the Spanish reggae was broadcasted all throughout the world, right? So it, it's it's kind of it's kind of silly when you know when I when I go to Latin America and I play and people, you know, all these bands are coming up to me and saying, Man, you you guys were our mm -hmm. first influence. <laughs> and I go, Wow, this is is it really weird, you know, because I didn't even know how to speak Spanish back then. <laughs> but, hey, I, I interviewed Gerardo and he had he had a really s similar experience, you know, being, mm. having half the song was in Spanish, you know. Right. Yeah. So, yeah, you know, I mean, the whole immigrant experience is interesting like that, because I think, you know, I don't want to get political, but 
the Latin American community is very marginalized, right? We're, we're in so invisible in so many ways. Um, we've been here forever. We've been here before there was the United States, right? Yeah. And, uh, and for some reason, we haven't been included into the national myth per se, right? So um, a lot of us really take that personal, you know, and, and, and people, even, even some of us that are second, third generation, I'm, yeah. I'm third generation. Right. And it's like, no, nah, man, we're here. And I was there. I remember listening to my grandfather being in the packing shed. My grandfather was a farmer and, and I'm not going to, I'm not going to put up with this, you know, the, this, uh, me being called something other than I am. I'm an American. I'm an American and we've been here since the beginning and we've contributed and we contribute a lot. <laughs> right. Yeah. Well, and and I'm going to yeah. make sure that, that our, our ingredient in our cultural part of our culture is music. And I'm going to make sure that it's present in, in, in the, uh, in media and in the mainstream, you know, the life that we're living. It, it's, it's interesting. Cause I, I was born in, in Arizona and Phoenix and then San Diego and then Orange County and, you know, California. So Immigrants and, and, and Mexicans have been part of my my entire life. I mean, when I was in junior high, at Pershing Junior High in San Diego. <laughs> I we, remember that. We had integration. My cousins went to Pershing, yeah. <laughs> so we, we had in, we, they integrated. They bust in kids from all over. So we had kids from Barrio Market Locos, Barrio Encanto Locos. We had all the different areas of San Diego were all bust into my school, and then they didn't all get, get along. But, you know, so, but but integration was just part of it. So it's kind of weird. And then, you know, if, when I travel for work and I go to areas that are 98% white, it's weird because all of a sudden I'm not, but th you understand that they, they've never seen, they don't, it's not where they grew up. Yeah. So yeah. Think, well, it, it's, and you've seen it around the world, you know, it's changing. It's changing. Yeah. I mean, I went, I just did a tour across the United States and, you know, there was, there wasn't any community that I went to where you didn't experience this multicultural mix of people. So I can understand how to some people um, call it nostalgia, call it fear, mm -hmm. call it xenophobia and its worst, um, you know, incarnation. But I understand that, that, that things are changing the world. Yeah. This, the, the United States is changing rapidly and drastically. And, you know, um, but it's part of our makeup, right? We, we cannot survive. I mean, it, yeah. Not only are we not our, not only are we an immigrant nation, and that is the foundation of the United States. But on top of that, we can't survive without immigrants because our standard of living makes it so that we feel embarrassed to do certain types of music. I mean, certain types of work. work. Yeah. Right. So. A lot of us feel like, no, I'm not going to pick the vegetables. No, I'm not going to wash the dishes. I'm not going to babysit. I'm not going to be a gardener. So all of those jobs are reserved for people that don't have papers, that, that aren't legal, yeah. don't have legal status in the United States. And it, unless that changes, we're always going to need an influx of people that don't have papers. Because once you have papers... You're not gonna do that. Then you can go get either. a real job. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> right, right. You know, so yeah, it's a it, it's a pickle that this nation is in. Where they're, they're, you're not gonna stop. You're not gonna stop immigration, no matter how hard you you, you try it. it yeah. we're, we're dependent upon. Well, it. I, we've we've never stopped it. It's interesting because, it, at least in, in my in my day job in, industry, the entrepreneurs are all Latinos. All they're all entrepreneurs. Whether they're, I mean, I. I I have a, an account up in North California. They have three stores. It's a mom, dad, and, and now the kids run one of the stores. But they started doing uh, swap meets in Mercados. And 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 then they got one store, and then the dad wanted to start another store, and then he built another, you know. Right. But, but that's in one you know, generation. When, when, you come, when you come from another country, um, like Mexico, right, that a yeah. place where it is really hard to make a buck. And I, and I have, uh, you know, I, I, I have so many amazing friends down there. Um, 
in Mexico. And I've, I've really learned what friendship was in my time living in Mexico. I mean, I, not that I don't have friends. I, you know, I love, I love my friends that I grew up with, but Mexicans taught me so much about just letting go of this sort of, um, you know, what is it that this, this sort of standard of living that we feel we have to maintain, right? The car, the, 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 the new car every few years, the house, the way we dress, these sort of brands that make us are supposed to, you know, define us or yeah. are supposed to make us feel better about ourselves and in, right? Um, because they don't, they don't have, and yes, they do, they play around with it. They'll get their, you know, their Gucci this or Gucci that. And, but for the most part, I, when I reality they, sets in. I prefer in, if they get Stetson. <laughs> All right, there you go. <laughs> there you go. By the way, I need a hat. Do you have a hat that that, that might be able to fit these dreads in? <laughs> well, just cut the top out. <laughs> there we go. Hey, we'll start a new fashion. Hey, Dreadlock uh, cowboy hats. <laughs> but, um, you know, it's funny because I didn't buy my first pair of cowboy boots till I went down to Mexico and I started looking around. I said, man, these guys look sharp, you know? And I went and I bought myself. I got, I got my pair of black cowboy boots i don't wear them around as much anymore because i'm kind of back into my hippie phase but uh <laughs> but i got them they're 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 there in the uh in you know and i and i was i was sporting them on stage for a little bit and uh, i pulled them out every once in a while Dude, you gotta understand 90 percent of cowboy boots are made in leon mexico wow really yeah yeah all the all and the, why lay on because I guess because of the cattle industry is real strong there or what no because all the fact that's literally where the factories are right so uh, you had cousins and, and brothers that all started boot companies and uh, Los Altos, they all, they, and they're, they're all down in that area. And that's where, just where the, um, the, le the leather tannery was happening. Huh. And you need just tins. So, like, that's where our factory is. And like I said, probably 90% of, of cowboy boots are made in that one city. There are so many Mexicans that are not going to give up. There's, there, it doesn't matter how fashion progresses man they're gonna wear their they're gonna sport their cowboy hat they're gonna sport their cowboy boots they're always gonna have you know their shirt with the little pearly buttons and yeah, stuff buddy. like that I mean, and, like uh, that. <laughs> exactly exactly it's it and i love it i mean that that, that kind of cultural uh pride is you know it it, it, it it's just so impressive to me I've always loved to see a man walk in, you know, sporting their Western gear. It to, to me, it's a sense of pride. It, it makes me proud to be Mexican. Well, you got in, in two weeks, uh, December 1st through the 10th is the national finals rodeo. It's in Las Vegas. So I worked there for 16 straight days. So 16 days in a hotel in Vegas sounds great, but as you know, not so great <laughs> at, at our age. I'm like, eh, I'm going to sleep. Yeah, yeah. If you're, but it's cool because I, I meet people from out. literally around the world. And you know, another big place for um, uh, cowboys is uh, Brazil. Oh, yeah. Yeah, they got a lot of, yeah. lot of bull riders and everything. Well, they, you know, and, and agriculture is huge. And then, you know, talking about music, right? I mean, yeah. Um, it's so interesting. Every country has its strain of country yeah. Western okay. style music, provincial music that tends to um, be very, um, you know, for some reason, uh, music from Slavic countries, uh, polka. Yeah. Uh, you know, that that type of uh, the, the, those uh, three chord, you know, one, four, five oriented type of music is what people in provincial communities yeah. like to listen to. And it and it sounds the same in Brazil. They're singing in Portuguese, but they got that same twangy thing going on. You know, they 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 put a little bit of blues in there. Yeah. And 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 sometimes it's it's the biggest music in Brazil. I mean, I've had an opportunity to spend a lot of time and I've I we've toured in some pretty uh yeah. you know uh, out in the boondocks kind of places and, and man, the Cowboys come out, you know what I mean? It, it's, yeah. uh, it's something that, um, is, 
very ingrained in the whole new world America. Um, you know, when people came and they settled from Europe, they went out to these, um, you know, they, 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 they were looking for, for something that, that was similar to, um, to what they were feeling in the past. And, and that whole cowboy, that whole country tradition is, is made it made a big difference and i know personally because my grandfather came from chihuahua right yeah, my yeah. grandfather never really d took on the cowboy um uh sort of image the shirts he did but he always had a kind of like a, a straw fedora he yeah. always wore one of those and that was what his generation were wearing they would wear the khakis right and they'd wear yeah, the round yeah. the round and, and I, he might have had some uh you know, some cowboy boots for 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 going out and stuff like that. But it was always kind of like the round worker sort of yeah, the round uh, house. Yeah. Yeah. The sort of boots. And and but, you know, that, that was that was and he always had uh, the short sleeve white shirt with the khakis. And there was a pocket here and it was always had a pen and a little notepad and a handkerchief either in his back pocket, you know. Still, um, we still we still sell those every day. Nice, you know that, that kind of stuff is that, and and that's what Chicanos wore forever they in uh, in, yeah, in the yeah. United States, and it, it it's and I still have friends, homies today that uh, they got that they'll have the little pinstripe white shirt, but it's always got to be sort of white based. Yep, uh, exactly. <laughs> we sell a lot of them, <laughs> especially in my territory. <laughs> so what? That's what, great, man. So what we're doing today, Kino, is we're announcing the country release of Kino McWinney's new music. <laughs> yeah. See, you could do a reggae-infused country song somehow. You know what? I, I, I love, um, well, the Mexicans' uh, answer to country music is very Texan-oriented, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, the most popular music in Mexico today tends to be either like a polka based um yeah uh, norteño right and norteño is interesting because it was a music that developed along the border of mexico and i or mexico and texas the, the states of chihuahua and nuevo leon very you know what 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 every what is very distinct about the northern um, states of Mexico is they have a lot of grass. The beef industry was very, very strong when there's lots of water, you know, it's, uh, it, it's, it's perfect. And nowadays the water is a problem, but, but everybody knows that up in Northern Mexico is where you get the greatest beef, some of the greatest beef in the world, you know? Um, and that affiliation with Texas was important. German immigrants, they brought in the squeeze box. They brought in the, yeah. uh -huh. um, the accordion, Right. And they started playing this oompa music. And you could hear, you know, the yodel, you know, the yodel, the, the whole yodel thing. Right. Yeah, yeah. And then Mexicans grabbed that and they started, they, they invented this instrument called the bajo sexto, which is this very loud guitar, guitar yeah. that you can play without amplification it's a 12 string guitar and they got this big gnarly skank you know this this, this um on on the on the offbeat so it's gank 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 you can hear anywhere you can hear yeah. without amplification you'll hear it a mile away and um and you know they fuse this type of music and today it's still just the number okay. one music in Mexico, you know, and, 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 and I love that stuff. I love Texas. Um, I'm a big fan of Texas tornadoes and Fetty <laughs> Friender and, um, yeah. um, uh, you know, oh, Texas blues, um, all of it's that Stevie stuff. Ray Vaughan, some of the, yeah, yeah. It's, um, awesome. yeah. it's definitely in my blood and I've been a big, big fan. Uh, little Joe y la familia. It, it, Texas has such a, interesting take on music and funny enough i just signed with this label in monterrey which monterrey is a border state with yeah. texas um and the first thing i said was listen we're we're gonna finish this reggae album but as soon as i'm done with that 
I want to do some regional Mexican stuff. And I want to do some Texas fused uh, music because um, that's their specialty. They know I'm how to, to they know boots. how to do that. I'm yeah. Yeah. To... I'm going to have to get my boots. We're going to have to, we're going to have to re- <laughs> redesign the hat with the whole, <laughs> but we'll, we'll get to it, Pete. <laughs> there you go. Yeah. Dude, that's awesome. How, I, I, if you, if my listeners couldn't tell, the music teacher was coming out there for a little bit, talking about the different musicians and all that. So, you you had a number one Billboard hit chart in the early nineties, mid nineties, like ninety four, right, ninety five. Yep, yeah. And then you became a high school school teacher. That doesn't yeah. happen every day. You know, I um, I had a tough time with the music business. I, yeah. I really did. Um, I got into reggae music really because of the message and yeah. because of the idea of growing up in the United States. One thing that's always been prominent was our issue with race. And um, it's something that preoccupied me from the very beginning, being half white, half Mexican, having to deal with that uh, yep. clash of cultures, right? Mm, but then on top yeah. of that, my father died when I was seven years old and my mother remarried a black man. So, you know, right from the beginning, um, as a as a young man, I had those three cultures in yeah. my life and feeling that pull and that conflict um, and re- dealing with it every day from yeah. my family. I didn't have to go outside, <laughs> you know, <laughs> yeah. to see it. I could see that there was really serious um, sense of, of discomfort um, that people were having a tough time in my family dealing with the fact that my mom, uh, being this full-blooded Mexican woman, married a black man, right? And all of a sudden, my white family is going, man, this, you know, what's going on? my grandson is being raised by a black man. You know what I mean? So, and I came from good old hillbilly, on my white side, you know, my dad grew up in Lakeside. You know Lakeside. <laughs> I know Lakeside. He went, he went to Lakeside High School. Yeah, yeah. Um, or I'm sorry, Santee. Santee. He went to Santee High School. Yeah. There was no Lakeside High School, right? Um, so I come, you know, my my white side is white. serious, yeah, white, yeah. country. Um, and we know all the elements that come along with that culture and, and unfortunately the ignorance that comes with that culture. Fortunately, my mom's, my mom, my father's sister, my aunt Clyde, she's probably my biggest cultural intellectual mentor. She went to school and she, you know, she just became this hardcore, uh, champion of the people. She's a attorney. She was somebody that uh you know was really into women's rights she was she defended uh women and she was a marriage sort of you know she was into sort of that uh marriage uh law uh, um, family law sort of um uh, uh sector so you know i uh, i guess this all leads to reggae music was a a gift to me because I saw that this was a way that I could deal with all of this um, f- conflict in me and spread a message that brought big people together, a yeah. message that really tried to build bridges between communities. And that's, you know, that that's been um, always my number one priority with music and my number one goal. And when the whole pop thing came in and baby, I it, it was just like, and the fame, it was just like, you know what? This is not it wasn't supposed what to I was. It was and, and the record company didn't understand. They didn't want to hear about peace and love. It was just like, you know what? We just want another baby. I love your way. And I said, well, that's, it's not what I was doing it yeah. for. Baby. I love your way came out in 1994. Yeah. In 1995, I shaved my dreads off and I was, I struggled through like another 
six, seven years of the music business. And by the time 2002 came around, I was done. And I went back to school. I, I basically finished. I, I put Big Mountain okay. to rest. And I went back to school. Um, I got a, uh, a, a teaching credential. And I started teaching high school, and for ten years that was my that was that was my focus, and That's and I'm really glad I did it, you yeah. know, because I I uh, I was able to come back later to music refreshed and and not having a bitter feeling about music and not being overworked, not not allowing this music business to taint my perspective of who I am and yeah. what I'm doing music for. You know, you know, it's interesting, Maxi. Maxie Priest on my show said the exact, almost the exact same thing. Wow. He, he He's was, my good friend. He was in Jamaica during COVID. And that's when I talked to him. He was stuck down there. But he said he, you know, he took some years off because he just got tired of, of the touring and, and the, the headache of the music business. And he was using the COVID yeah. time, the time off as kind of the, to, to refresh and, and kind of get recharged about the music and, and making it about the music instead of the business of it. It we just talked interesting. A little you said bit the same about thing. That. You know, I mean, you, you know that me and Maxie, we lived in a bus together for seven <laughs> weeks this yeah. year. Yeah. <laughs> so we share uh, we share a couple of musicians, uh, our drummer and 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 keyboardist, um, Paul Castic and uh, Goofy Campbell. And so and we it's been like that for the last 20 years. So, yeah. And not only that, Maxi Maxi was a big influence uh, to me. It just um, it, I we I toured with him so much throughout the '90s, and he was a big help for me in terms of learning how to be a just a good you know a, a showman, you know, yeah. learning how to make everybody feel good and get into the party. You know, he he uh, he was a big influence in that way, and uh, he's always been a dear friend of mine. And well, you know, it's interesting. It's it's. I'm just putting this together now. He didn't like his, uh, he didn't want to record Wide Wide World, which was a cover. Yeah. You know, and, and it, it, he literally said, I didn't want to, I didn't want to sing it. I, I, I was done. I, I wanted to make, write my own, I wanted to do my own music. And the record label made him do it and it became his biggest hit. Now, 30 years later, he still has to sing it. You know what? And we talked about that too. We yeah. talked about how and, and, all of all of all of our best songs on Spotify are the songs that were forced upon us <laughs> <laughs> by the record, record company. Yeah. And uh, you know, it it, it it made us kind of, you know, I, I, I told him I said, I guess we probably should have listened to them a little more. <laughs> <laughs> or not. <laughs> <laughs> they kind of they I guess they knew what they were doing after all, but you know. Um, that's, that's the part about music that it's tough for a lot of times. We didn't, we didn't specialize in yeah. what it, what, what is a successful song at radio, right? We got into music because we love to sing. We were influenced by the people that we were influenced. And it just turned out that the people that we loved most in music were not radio people. Yeah. They were they were reggae musicians and that, and that's who inspired us. And they, you know, and, and even Bob Marley during his lifetime, he never cracked the top 40, Nope. you know? Um, so, so it's. And legend it, was it, remixed uh, over in, in England, you know? Yeah. 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 You know, it made it, to sound now, more, more poppy. And, and that me and Maxie, we were part of that generation where yeah, me too. we had to disguise reggae. Yeah. In order to have, have it be accepted, but by some radio. of your songs, and I was going to ask you this also: is some of your, you had some ska kind of elements, and like resistance, and and some of the it sounded to me, and I'm not a musician at all, but it sounded like you had some ska elements, and so like I know reggae can be from classical type music to I mean reggae isn't just Bob Marley. If there's a whole, you can yeah, mix well it up. it's 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 all the evolution of Jamaican music, you know yeah. Um, ska is probably was invented in Jamaica in early sixties, you know, late fifties. And it's funny cause there's a whole story about that. They say, some people say they kind of, they just started manipulating early, like R and B doo-wop 
sort of music. Like if you listen to Bob Marley stuff, Bob Marley's early stuff is ska. His yeah. biggest, his first hit, Simmer Down. Simmer Down. Slowly but surely, they started to slow down the beat, you know. But back then, all they were worried about was dancing. Yeah. Um, that, that was before I, they yeah, started be to, to, they started, you know, that was before they started to inject a lot of the very uh, spiritual and social political message of, oh, yeah. of the sixties. But in the fifties, it was, man, it was the Scatterlights. The Scatterlights was the main huge. backup band in, uh, in Jamaica and they backed up everybody. Right. Yeah. And, um, it was Bob Marley and the, you know, Peter Taj, Bunny Whaler and, uh, we, we were just talking about it last night um, that uh, Bob Marley's bass and drummer, uh, Aston, Family Man Barrett, yeah. and Carlton Barrett, they were brother duo. They were they were crucial, critical in um, in the evolution of taking ska and turning it into reggae. But there was also other spot. You know, there was rock steady uh for a while in blue beat um so it was it wasn't just well, like, straight from ska to reggae there was no, J- there was Jimmy, an evolution jimmy cliff kind of had more of a uh a calypso kind of feel mm-hmm. you know so yeah there, there's different different vibes there was a lot going on jamaica is an amazing place and i yeah. i talk about this a lot um in my live music i always you know sort of give a shout out to jamaica and just how much they've contributed to popular culture and not just on a music style on sort of an attitude style. The whole hip hop thing is very much uh, influenced by Jamaican bad boy culture. You know, it was just still pulse got third world Oswald. Oh yeah. You know, yeah, that that was the band era. That was, yeah, that was the, that was the era that really influenced us. We were super influenced by, Steel Pulse, Third World, and Oswald. That's exactly what you say. There was a couple other bands. There was a band called Chalice back in the day. Um, well, was Yellow Man kind yeah. of more with a rap, t- rap vibe. You know? Exactly. Dance Hall, the Yellow yeah, Man. Yeah. And then Sly, and- Sly and Robbie, which yeah. I just got, I just was had the pleasure of recording with Sly um, last year. Um, and he was so important with bringing in that what later would become hip hop, you know, the, 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 the boof boff, which, you know, for a while, everybody was stuck on the one drop. And then he's the one that came in with the kick on one snare on three. And just, he just kind of forced it in and, and everybody <laughs> yeah. started, everybody started to play. And it was like more of more of what was happening, sort of like that R and B thing. He wanted to get off of the, one the, the one drop because Westerners couldn't dance to that. Westerners couldn't dance to Bob Marley for yeah. a the long per- time. It was just, you know, they didn't, they just, it was so funny early on, you know, reggae scene, you know, people, Americans try to dance to reggae. They look, they look like, uh, <laughs> hey, you know, hey, hey. they look like ducks with, with too much mud on their feet or something like that. It was the funniest thing. And, you know, it's the people like Sly Dunbar, he, He's the one that kind of uh, forced this evolution of reggae that made it a lot more danceable for the world. Yeah, and that's that's kind of what they did with Legend, you know, with the album Legend, is they they remixed it all mm-hmm. and, and made it more poppy. Yeah, yeah, that was that was what we had to do. Uh, the m- mainstream, you know, radio, they weren't going to accept reggae on Jamaican terms. We all had to inject a lot of r&b a lot of rock yeah and th- third world was was crucial in that way because they really kind of uh they gave us a path they gave the rest of us a path yeah. of how to do that yeah i interviewed cat and, and that's what he said it was but you know because he has a classical training i mean he's a classical cellist i mean that's he's one of my favorite people in the whole world awesome. he is yeah. he is such a intelligent and just beautiful soul always willing to sit down and you know it, anytime yeah. i see him backstage he's he's always the same person he's always yeah. just such a pleasant human being and, and just a great 
you know, they do the music business. You can run into some characters. <laughs> <laughs> well, just like everything, right? You know, and uh, yeah. Kat is one of those people that just grounds you and you say, yes, I want to be like him because you, yeah. you know, sometimes you, you, you sometimes you think that the more of a character you are, the more you're going to be accepted by music or, you know, the, the more success you're going to have if yeah, you're eccentric yeah. and you try to take yourself, you know, out of your human element and you become sort of a clown or whatever like that. And Kat was one of these people that, you know, that I had some great role models. Thank God. Freddie McGregor, yeah. um, Marcia Griffiths, people that, you know, that older generation, like the regular people. <laughs> <laughs> you know, you had you had these characters. I'm not gonna name any names. Yeah, yeah. You know what I mean? But you had these characters that would run around and they would just be just goofball idiots, you know what I mean? And you'd sit there and you go, God, am I boring? You know? I don't want to be then, like that, but do I have and to? then you have, yeah, yeah your Barris Hammonds, your your Freddie McGregor's, your cat core, and all of Third World was like that, you know. Richie yeah. was like that as well, you know what I mean? It was just, it was, um, it, it, Third World was always very human and just very laid back and just beautiful human beings. Yeah. He, well, I, I don't, I mean, and maybe I'm just being fortunate, but I only reach out to the people I, I want to interview. You know what I mean? And yeah, they seem to be like the good people. Like there's some people I wouldn't put on my show doesn't matter where they're at or who they are because i you know yeah what are you gonna do you know what i mean it, it, it takes all kinds and i understand a lot of times the most successful geniuses in the world tend to be eccentric and tend to be kind of you know really look out of the box and and that's cool and we need those people in the world but um but it's no way to kind of have a lasting career you know what i mean it, yeah in order to in order to survive in this business you have to have your head intact you know you have to really uh, be a, a a a real human being because it, it that that eccentricity can only take you so far and it ends up closing a lot of doors yeah um you know of course you have your people that are just so talented and so successful it doesn't matter what they do the kanye west <laughs> uh see i'm not I'm not saying nothing. <laughs> yeah, 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 yeah. You know what I mean? It's just like, you know, guys like that, you go, wow. And people are still endorsing this guy? <laughs> Whatever. Okay. You know, uh, he's a musical genius. So I, I, I can't, I can't, uh, you know, I, I'm not going to criticize him on that level, but but you sit there and you go, wow. You know what I mean? It, 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 it's uh, Well, you've kind of how, how, this question. This is something I bring up to... Uh, I brought it up because I've interviewed a couple of really super famous people, right? I can't, I can't even wrap my head around it because you kind of, you got really famous and then you went back and caught, taught high school. You know what I'm saying? And, and uh -huh. you, I just saw you play at the Hollywood Bowl. <laughs> it's like, so I, I couldn't even wrap my head around being famous for 20 or 30 years, like Kanye famous, Michael Jackson famous, you know, that, that level Prince where you can't go anywhere. It, right know, and and everyone's saying yes to you everyone's like oh my god yeah oh you're so great you're so smart and, oh yeah those mm -hmm. shoes are wonderful those big rubber clogged things that he built you know someone had to go <laughs> kanye what are you doing man <laughs> but no one said uh, that to I, him, right it made me think because i didn't even know anything about those shoes that i was oh god i forget this one comedian but he says yeah he goes yeah you know the, you know what's good about uh you, they, they they discontinued those shoes but all you have to do is take a regular pair of sneakers put it in the microwave for <laughs> five minutes <laughs> <laughs> but you know what i mean it, um but i I, me, could, I i mean i i can't tell you what it's like to be on stage at the hollywood bowl i can't tell you what it's like to to be a kanye west you know i don't know i mean well, you know, and I can't really tell you, you know, I mean, there, there is levels in this business, Absolutely. but, but I'm, I'm about as famous as I would like to be. Right. <laughs> Fair um, enough. Well, wait till the country song comes out, man. Hey, you know, I mean, and that's fun. I mean, that's like, God, I think about, you know, I'm at a point in my life where, um, it's still a month, you know, I still have to be really careful about everything I'm, i've, I've kind of got myself you know kids once you get kids man you know you're 
your your choices and your your <laughs> your options are a lot more limited. So you have to be real careful, you know, because you just need to, to make sure that there's food in the fridge yeah, but... and uh, and the lights stay on, and, you know, and, and, and stuff like that. But um, but I'm at a point in my life where I'm able to entertain the idea of messing around with genres that, you know, we all like like me and like everybody. We were all influenced at one point. We were all sitting here going, man, I love that fucking tune. And this, you know, and, and we were sitting there going, this music is doing things to me and it's bringing things to my life that are so beautiful and and just inspire me and, and, yeah. and give me joy. And it doesn't matter where I'm at or, you know, I put on this song and this song makes me happy. Right. And so, you know, I'm able to kind of go back and and break myself out of the reggae genre, which I, I, you know, I, I love reggae. I'm always going to love reggae, but I'll be able to have fun and, and, and have, be guided by people that really know how to put, you know, music together, which, you yeah. know, e each, each music has its rules and playing, you know, playing music from Texas, man, that's, Definitely. you got to have some real guidance. Yeah. Cause yeah, trying to pick up an acoustic guitar the right way, that that that's that's not easy wouldn't even know <laughs> i i broke so many <laughs> fingers playing football <laughs> yeah no well you know it, it's that's the beautiful thing about country music is that they still use real instruments you know i i think a lot of uh musicians from my generation remember being in the studio and recording with a band and real using a real drum set we're using just a good old Fender jazz bass and you know and real micing up you yeah. know a, an micing amplifier. everything up. and uh eight track and, and country music Nat Nashville's famous for doing that and pretty soon Nashville is going to be the only place in the world that does that and every you know it's rare to find a situation usually you know when we're writing songs and we're starting songs it's a bunch of dudes On a around a computer going yeah. and you're going dude <laughs> you know what I mean? You, might, the, yeah. the, you start you start songwriting like that with this fucking stupid drum loop, you know, and and it's it's it, it's it's pretty sad. I just I watched uh, the uh, Beatles Get Back movie, you know, uh -huh. and uh, and watching them, you know, How they four came up, yeah, human beings sitting there grinding it out, you know, and just oh my god, I I. I it's funny because I used to be, and I know this happened to so many people. Um, for some reason, we all became Paul McCartney, not haters, but right. You know, it was like John Lennon and his mystique yeah. sort of took over. And, and people like me that have tried to be this peaceful warrior, we always kind of look towards John Lennon as being the, our favorite yeah. Beatle. After that movie, I completely changed you know what i mean it was just like i just became such a, an admirer and you know consider paul mccartney to be such a hero right you know and and john for sticking in with him but you could see that that paul mccartney was fucking the horse and the rest of the guys were sitting in the cart yeah <laughs> you know what I, mean? I still like you know because we are the same age you know when wings came out paul mccartney and wings right he had he had so many good songs, yeah, like just solid, great songs, right? And you're like, okay, well, who, you know, and, and John did his own thing, and then Ringo, and I mean, everyone had their own, yeah, own George, yeah, but, George. They they say that George was George sold the most records, yeah, after after after, after the, the Beatles. Beatles broke up, yeah, uh, but yeah, uh, yeah, but, but I, no, I, but you know, Paul, Paul McCartney, he, you could you could tell that that he was at that point at least um he was the he was the genius you know he was yeah. and he was the one that worked the hardest he was the more he was the more focused you know john was john was really distracted he was yeah. he was dealing with things other than music which i understand what that's all about because i i've had it yeah i've i've had that problem my whole career it's like you know you're a musician right uh, you know why don't you Put the sign down. Stop marching and fucking come record a song. <laughs> yeah, 
Yeah, yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, well, you know, that's and that's that's life, right? You um you get you get distracted, you get off course, and then all of a sudden you realize, okay, you know, it's been a while since I've had any real success, and I wonder why. It's like, well, maybe because you should put like more than two hours into writing a song. <laughs> well, yeah, I don't. I mean, I I wouldn't even know. I, I literally like I my daughter has the the, the song skills of writing songs, recording, singing. She does, I mean, full thing, producing. I don't, she didn't get it from me. You know, I love music and I listen to all kinds my, you know, another good, um, another documentary that's cool to watch is um, Metallica. Hey, but you, but you have a cool microphone. Your microphone is way cooler than mine. So I got this <laughs> from uh, Steve Stevens, the guitarist from Billy Idol. Oh, wow. So I interviewed him. And, cool. And, and these are the Mike's uh, Sontronics in England. And uh, so they sponsor him and they came out with a podcast, mic. So he hooked me, kind of hooked me up. But I love the color. I just, I know that. Well, see, my whole show is green, right? So that's how it is. But nice. my, my first 80 episodes, uh, Kino, were with the same headphones you have on. And I literally, I, I just told the story yesterday. I taped it to my face because I wasn't used to, I'd be walking around. And so all of a sudden, I'd go back and listen to my show, and the audio because the mic would be swinging. So oh, right, right, would, right, right. The levels were just oh, terrible. Oh, okay. I scotch taped it to my face, so it would be even. But yeah, I it, that, it that, that 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 I'm sure that looked real professional. It wasn't video back then; it was audio only. Oh, okay. Now, uh, now, now that I'm doing video, I have to have the the nice mic. No, you're looking good, man. Shit, <laughs> you know, you're giving uh, Howard Stern a run for his money. That's for damn sure. I don't want to do that. I don't. No, I'm good. <laughs> I used to like Howard. I used to listen to him a lot when I. How do you fill up your time when you're traveling? When you're on the bus, are you writing music? Are you bu bu bugging out? Are you just zoning? Meditating? I mean, you, you know, you I um, on the bus, your bunk is like your yeah your only uh, space of. Zen. Sanity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Yeah. And Zen, exactly. And there's not a whole lot you can do while you're laying down. Um, yeah. So I finished uh, Vikings, the whole series. <laughs> there you go. And the other one, the the, the Last Kingdom. I was okay. on a Vikings kick for some reason. And um, and started to dabble. And I, I couldn't, once I finished those two, I was like, oh, man, everything else sucks. You know? <laughs> I couldn't find anything that was uh, that was really uh, grabbing me, but uh, I was. I remember I was uh, I was downloading like when we would go because we would have a hotel room one or one or two hotel days a yeah. week, and and I would use the Wi Fi to you know to just Upload. load load up my iPad. Yeah, yeah. And uh, you know, um, I I I spent a lot of time in my bunk. I really did. I kind of, I, I got this, this, this kind of comfort zone there. I'm, I'm one of these people that I can only deal with, with so much social interaction. And then I have to turn off. I, I, I love, like, I love audio. Oh, I did a lot of audio books. I do a lot of audio books. Yeah. Me I'm an audible. I give my $15, my 15 hard earned dollars to <laughs> audible every month. And I Jeff Bezos she, at Amazon appreciates that. Oh yeah, I'm sure. But Bezos, I'm sure he's he's hurting every month until I until my oh, uh, fifteen dollar payment comes in. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, but you know, I, like I right now, I'm listening to um, I spirituality. This is is really into it. I mean, really really cool. I really enjoy it. I and I'll listen to everything. It'll be like the biography of Mohammed or, yeah. and then the next, like Karen Armstrong has a lot of really cool stuff. The history of this or that God or Christianity or Judaism. And, and, uh, um, I'm getting like, you know, being here, um, got me into the, the whole history of yoga yeah. and, uh, and you know, the, the, some of the legends, Buddha, I've been, I've been watching a lot of, a lot of different stuff on Buddha, and I'm we're, actually I'm going from here. I go directly to India. Oh, that's gonna be amazing. Big Mom, Big Mom's gonna do like uh, three weeks in India, 
So I'm going from like, this is like India light to <laughs> India. <laughs> right? Getting you ready for that next level. And I've been to India before. And, you know, my first trip to India, and I think maybe anybody has it, it's overwhelming. It's yeah. like the sensory candy is just too much. And you're, 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 you're just trying to deal with what you've seen. And then, the music, I forget what kind of music. Lang -a -lang -a -lang -a -lang -a -lang -a lang a lang a lang a lang a lang a lang. You know, you're just you're dealing with a lot of lot of different uh, inputs into your brain and your senses that uh, that, that you never. So it, you, you know, it, it's it's a little overwhelming. So I'm kind of excited about going. And actually, I, I didn't mention this, but my grandmother was a big India buff, and she went to uh, she oh, wow. went to India. She was a huge hippie. She went to India in search of her guru. Uh, she went for Sai Baba, and then she ended up running into Bhagwan Osho, and and that changed her life. And I'm not going to say anything more about that because it's a little bit of a controversial subject in my brain. Um, but uh, but I'm trying, you know. But I I make peace. It was so funny. Uh, I I was telling the story yesterday to the my host here, and he goes, "Oh, is that the guy that has that video about?" the flexibility of the word fuck i said probably <laughs> i don't know probably he was like the uh uh bagwam is is like the the howard stern of um I got you now. of 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 uh of gurus yeah yeah i i know yeah. nothing about that so now I'm yeah 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 oh well his name is Osho now. I, I don't know when when they decided to change his name. When when my grandmother was into it, he was named Bhagwan Sri Rajneesh. And, and he was just controversial. You remember that community up in Oregon? Yeah, yeah. I watched that documentary. Okay, so, so, you know, yeah, wild country. So, you know, my grandmother went there. Oh my my grandmother lived in India. Then she went to Oregon. And she stayed there until Bhagwan got kicked out. And, you know, she was never able to really piece life together after that unfortunately but she was an amazing grandmother oh, man, and uh and she, you know my first my first example of a revolutionary there you go and you're still going i was gonna ask you what's the most influential place or city you've been to boy probably kingston jamaica all right that makes sense. you know um that makes sense. Jamaicans have this interesting blend of spirituality, you know, politics um, it, it, that uh, that was good for me. You know, I I, I kind of had decided that listen, I'm going to be a messenger in this life, and I'm going to try to prepare myself the best I can to give a message that is just provocative enough to challenge people's Sorry, yeah. perception of, of the status quo that we're living in. But at the same time, recognize that I don't know anything and I can't be coming off as some know it all. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Know it all and superior uh, in any one subject. And you know, Jamaica is this super spiritual place that treat the Bible like, like the Bible, <laughs> a guide. Yeah. The guide in life, you know? Yeah. And, uh, and everybody speaks in parables over there. Um, and, um, but at the same time, they're really realistic and direct about life and, and super proud Jamaicans. I don't think yeah. there's anybody, any culture that consider can consider themselves more proud than Jamaicans, right? It, it, they just have this tremendous sense of pride in their culture and um, and and strength and confidence in their path in life, you know. And so, um, I just really it, it admired that and it kind of gave me I always tell people it gave me a pair of spectacles to view life yeah in this in this world that I appreciate because I I think that I'm able to cut through a lot of bullshit um because of that 
that perspective that I learned from Jamaicans. And at the same time, um, I like to consider myself somebody that that believes in God and believes in something higher than this life that we're living or whatever it is, whether you want yeah. to call it God or, or the universe or spirituality. I, you know, I do want to put life in check and say, you know, what we're doing, what I'm doing here is not so important that I'm going to become an asshole and start yeah. taking advantage of people. Right. So um, I, I don't want to be a burden on anybody. I don't want to be a burden on my society or my family or anything like that. But at the same time, um, all of this crap that we're, that we're running around sweating about is just not that important. I, I always, I always, I always tell people, you know, I, I live pretty close to the ocean and I'm like, that body of water doesn't care who I voted for. It, they don't, the, the whales and the sharks that are in that water, they don't care whether I'm a Democrat or Republican, they don't care about anything other than the basics. And I think that's what we kind of, we, we overthink things so much and think our opinions matter more than everybody else's. So I don't know. I just, I'm just kind of chill. Like, you know, the, the, the mountain, you know, like the name of your, your, your group, you know, has an interesting backstory, but that mountain's still there. That mountain's not going to care in 50 years or 100 years or 200 years or 800 years about anything so that's a good way to think about it you know it's uh um you know are, are, are the priorities that we set uh in this life uh can be real complicated can be very convoluted and all mixed up in this or that or they can just be simple and um, very local uh, dealing with, you know, the people that you find in your community. And, and you're right. I mean, in the long run, it's not, it's not going to make a whole lot of difference. Most of it has to do with whether we can sleep at night. Well, I only say that because like in 10,000 years, earth will still be here. We might not be on it with the things that we've done, but the planet itself will still be here. You know, it was here during the ice age. It was here during the dinosaurs. It, I mean, I think humans think this little myopic, we're a blip on the, on the, on earth, on, on the time scale, time frame of earth. We're, we're a, not even a check mark. You it's know? so strange, you know, um, you know, when I, when I, years. when I meditate, when I meditate and I've been meditating, I hope I, I, I hope I, I stay on this horse for a while at least, but I'll shoot uh, you a message every once in a while. <laughs> <laughs> you meditate last night. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Let's, let's hope, let's hope I hold on to the vibe, you know, but, but that is kind of like one of the things that I meditate on. It's like, yeah. you know, really Kino, if you were to die today, um, you know, would you be okay with it? You know, would, yeah, yeah. would you, would you, uh, would you really regret, you know, something? And of course, you know, usually the things that I, that I think about is my kids. Yeah. Are my kids going to be okay? You know, and they, they are, you know, fortunately, thank God, you know, I got kids that, that, that um, I think are conscientious and, um and they're they're industrious enough they'll they'll get through it they'll get through it <laughs> yeah. they'll have to deal with with hardships that we all had to deal with right shit growing up in san diego i know <laughs> i told you what i know you 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 if you grew up in what san carlos or del you know del yeah. cerro area right uh it wasn't easy man the 80s was fucking a hellhole right <laughs> I can tell you, like Henry was a predominantly white school, predominantly, but not all. But then when they bust in, we got probably 18 to 20 buses every morning, right? And they literally brought in gang members from other areas of all into one school. Right. The last day that, that I spent in school before we moved up to Orange County, there was a fight on the volleyball courts between the Laotian, Laotian gang 
and I think it was Market. I think it was Market, or maybe it might have been Encanto. But they were picking up the volleyball poles and swinging them at each other. And they had knives and throwing stars. The Laotians brought their throwing stars. And it was like 20 yeah. on 20. And I'm like, I, I, remember, I, I tell that story all the time. You know, one, one of my favorite things to eat is pho. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Oh, dude, I can tell I you. Grew up, <laughs> and my mom, my mom still lives on Altadena, man. Right, you know, between 50th and 51st, right that era on Alcohol Boulevard. And, yeah, yeah. You know, where I went to high school is just right there right and uh and i remember being in the seventh grade we went you know summer break we come back and all of a sudden there's like 150 vietnamese kids right yeah. that just landed and it's Literally. just like you're just and and it was uh it was a cultural shock to us and you know they were we were tripping they yeah. were yeah sipping a whole lot more than us right? everyone had really attitude been, and um but that's the beautiful thing about san diego right we were forced to deal yeah. with all of this cultural mix yeah. and um you know and 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 then you know the drugs i mean i i remember being in high school was like maneuvering through you know, just all of these pressures to do this or yeah. do that. And, and, you know, I, I think about my kids and, and, I didn't and have how those they pressures negotiate. My dad, my dad would have ruined me. <laughs> so <laughs> well, good. Good, about that. good, you know, good. Because it was uh, in, 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 you know, in my neighborhood, for some reason, I was, I found myself in a crowd of guys that, they just didn't want to deal with reality. You know what I mean? And we were, yeah. and, 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 and we were all just finding a way to escape every day. And, and, and some of my friends never made it out. Right. Yeah. Some of my friends are still stuck in that rut and thank God that, um, you know, that, 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 that I'm not, but a lot of, a lot of what got me straight and got me focused on other things was reggae music, you know, and just, just said, when did you, and, when, and how did you uh, hear about reggae music? I'm really curious. Cause you know, it would have been me and my dad, which the beautiful thing, you know, when my mom married my father, the man that raised me. Yeah. All of a sudden, I was listening to Overnight. He brought in his record collection and, you know, it was Miles Davis, Stevie Wonder, yeah. the Commodores, Ohio players. He was a Dinner, lover of music. Yeah. And it was a huge uh, jazz bebop. And then later what evolved, San Diego ended up becoming a big jazz town. You know, not a lot of people know. My first San concert, Diego was sort of. My first concert was at San Diego State University Amphitheater. It was George Benson. Yeah. And 19, that was, you know. 81. 88. And that was the bridge, right? That was the yeah. bridge to what became cool jazz or Miles Davis and his experimenting kind of turned everybody into this very commercial uh, type of, of of jazz music and, yeah. and so we had all these jazz we had 88.3 we had <laughs> yeah. 98 cool jazz and everybody was cool and, and all the DJs started talking like this and blah 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 <laughs> you know it's so funny to think back on that era but um, me and my dad we used to sit and watch you know we were trying to get to know each other he was my new father and he was a, an amazing father I mean he just was he wouldn't let me get talk about getting away with shit, man. He would find out where I was. Yeah, man. I remember being, I remember being me and my homies being in an alley somewhere like five blocks away from the house. And I'd be sitting here with the bong smoking, you know, the weed. And all of a sudden it's like he'd pull up and I'm going. And we're all just sitting there going, how did he know? How did he know? Home. <laughs> we could not hide from the guy, you know? And uh, he would pick us all up. We would all get in this big gray van of his and he'd take us down to school and he'd turn us into the true enough. <laughs> <laughs> and all, all my friends would be going, oh man, this is fucked up, you know? <laughs> but, and, uh, and, you know, one way that we got to know each other was watching 60 Minutes. Yeah. You know, we, we'd sat and he kind of got, he got me into reading the San Diego Union on Sunday and, and yeah. watching 60 Minutes and 
and watching the news and that was you know the evening news and and we did that together and he kind of like you know he would he would tell me about politics and tell me about current events and things like that but one time 60 minutes had bob marley and the whalers a special bob marley and the whalers rastafari jamaica all of that ganja right yeah. so oh man when i saw bob singing it was like i was mesmerized i just this guy his dreads the ganja this revolutionary for some reason i was always i always kind of had this very left leaning uh, uh approach and 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 um political you know constitution to me yeah. and i think a lot of that had to do with um my my biological father when he graduated from um cal poly pomona um we went straight to honduras and my dad worked for dole and we lived in Honduras for two years. I, I spent my sixth and seventh year in Honduras. And I was never the same. When I, you know, we, we, yeah. we, and he actually got, he was murdered down there. Seven years old, I had to deal with one, my dad being murdered. And then three weeks later, we're back in the United States after me spending my sixth and seventh year down there. Yeah. And, and I, I was fluent in Spanish. I ended up forget you know losing all my spanish in the yeah. in the in the in the interim but except for my accent i had a pretty good accent the whole time and uh but you know it was like i came back to the united states with with understanding things that americans didn't understand sure. and it was just kind of like you know you guys are you guys are tripping on a lot of things that people around the world don't trip on you yeah. know and 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 it's it, it gave me a perspective in life and sort of this idea that that you know United States is is and I I even knew back then it was you know American influence in Honduras and in a lot of places around the world yeah. um, is one of colonialism and this you know hyper market capitalism that affects communities everywhere. It's like we 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 all talk crap about Hondurans yeah. and Honduran immigrants, right? And they're bringing in crime. But nobody talks about the fact that there's been U.S. fruit companies in Honduras since the 1890s, and they've been manipulating the government, yeah. elections, coups, what have you, right? And and the, Hondur the poor Hondurans are sitting there going, well, you know, what the hell? We got five families that own everything. Yeah. And it's because they answer to the fruit companies. Right. So it right away, I realized, man, Americans are ignorant about what's going on outside of our borders. Well, that's why I think travel is important for people. And that's why I like my super show. important. I mean, you got to go out and see super, them. even if it's a different state. Super. I mean, you go, like I said, like I, you go to North Dakota, which I've been to, you know, they don't know what it's like to be a border town down here, you know, and and conversely, I don't know what it's like to be up there. So, like, I have to go and see. You know, you go to Indiana. I, I always joke, I, Indiana, southern Indiana is so white. There's white people at Taco Bell. I mean, <laughs> yeah. you want know to talk about it's all white yeah. people. Like, Whoa. You know what I mean? And, 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 and if you keep things on that level perspective, I've always been the person that it didn't matter where I go. I'm the type of person I sit, you know, in an airplane, and the person next to me, um, it's really hard for me to not to strike up a conversation, yeah, me too. right? And say, you know, who, and I know I got dreadlocks. I look like, you know, but right away, the, just that my perspective, my, my, the, 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 the person that I am growing up in the family that I am, um, I had to deal with, you know, my, my white grandparents and we yeah. sat there and we, and we talked about, you know, whatever. And it was, but there was a demeanor about it that I knew I got into their groove. It wasn't, I wasn't going to go in and try to rock the boat. I knew that, you know, there was a certain groove to them. And, and, and I've, I've always been that type of person that it didn't matter where I went. It could be this little white lady from Indiana and, and I'll find things to talk about. And yeah. it's a beautiful conversation. And I know that I need to probably stay away from some subjects and that's fine. Um, 
you know, we, we don't have to be always engaged in our agenda, right? right. <laughs> the agenda that we have uh, uh, that, as, as human beings, we can always find um, just mutual, interesting, and, and, and meaningful things to, where, to interact I, I really about. That's where music comes in, into handy. You know, because totally. when I go to a concert, I don't know. I don't, I don't care what, what politics any of these people have. I just know we all like listening to the big mountain, right? It's like, we're at the Hollywood bowl. We don't care. No one, no one's like, well, yeah, I like, you know. Yeah. You know what? I, and you know what? It, and it took me a while to learn that. I mean, it, it, you know, there was being the white guy in reggae. I always kind of felt like, oh, well, I have to prove myself and I have to be more politically outspoken or I have to, you know, prove that I, that, that I'm, that I have the right to, to play in this music that talks about that essentially is about black militant, black liberation. Right. Yeah. But, but, and, but, but knowing Bob, Bob was biracial. I mean, he didn't, yeah. he, he didn't, he didn't have his dad in his life, but. Right. He, he but was, you know, he, I mean, over the years, I've, I've I've come to realize: listen, people are not here for that, Kino. You know, let let do let your records do the work. If people want to listen to that, let them listen to that. Yeah. But when you're in a live situation, this is a place of harmony. This is a place where we all. This is a safe space where everybody should be proud one, of who they are and where they come from, right? And this is this is. Um, a place where we need to we need to let go of all of that other pressure and find a commonality yeah amongst us all and and a, a real spirit of what reggae is supposed to be about reggae is supposed to be about bringing people together and and really having a heartbeat that that, that heartbeat that we all share every single human being in the world shares and you know so i uh that that Big mountain shows nowadays are are definitely that. I appreciate. It. I, I don't want. To, I I hate taking up more of your time. What's the best <laughs> way for my listeners? I, I I literally like like whenever I meet people like especially our age group, San Diego. I'm kind of like we're. It's a good vibe, but um. Yeah. What's the best way for my listeners to to find out what you and Big Mountain have coming up? Are, are you, uh, you got the solo stuff? So that's gonna be cool. Yeah, I got um. Uh, you know, I, 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 I pretty much post all of, all of the stuff that I do on big mountain band. Uh, the Instagram is kind of like the one thing that everybody's sort of agreed on. Yeah. Um, and then the older folks, you, we can always, uh, <laughs> depend on Facebook <laughs> and it's always big mountain band. Um, I think, I, yeah, it's big mountain band on Facebook and big mountain band. I think we finally got our blue check. I'm not sure why Instagram um uh was giving us such a hard time for a while um but uh yeah that seems to be uh the the, the main way and bigmountainband.com is our is our uh, website as well yeah you know that's uh uh there i do have a big mountain kino on uh on instagram but i i you know i it, it's i kind of use that to to, to, oh, to, to be a little bit more personal. Uh, where are you going to put out the the new music? Is that going to be on on the Big Mountain? Yeah, yeah. We we have the new album. It's yeah. called uh, Return of the Goddess, and that's going to be um, released in March. And that is in all English except for one song. And we're, we we redid uh, the Eagles, the Great Eagles song, Hotel California. So, um, have you ever heard of that, Magic Pajak? Oh yeah, he read it. I Hotel toured California. with him. I toured with him. I I knew his producer, and he was in Redonda. He lived in Redonda for a couple yeah. of years before he moved back yeah, to New yeah. York. Yeah, he hung out. Uh huh. He hung out. And as a matter of fact, um, I was in the car with him one time. A couple, like, a couple of the a, one of the the bass player of uh, Big Mountain, Mike Ortiz. Um, he played with him a long time, and then a guy that played with us for a long time, um, Danny Lopilato. He played with Majek a lot. As well, they both had uh, and talk about a, an interesting character. <laughs> yeah, I was shocked when I found out he passed away, but yeah, and he was a genius. I mean, that Magic is one of those quote unquote geniuses yeah. that 
that changed music and unfortunately, you know, had a lot of personal issues, had a lot of, you know, yeah. tough time uh, uh, keeping himself functional and, and healthy. But, uh, but you know, he, he was one of those guys that he could pick up any instrument, anything and make it, make it sound amazing. And he could play um, guitar with his teeth. <laughs> That's what Charlie told me. Charlie's like, he played all the instruments on the, on, on the, on the album that he produced. I'm like, what? Oh yeah. Everything. Oh no, Matt Majek was incredible. Yeah. And so, he was a nice uh, guy Hotel California. I mean, he was he was he was weird, but but you know, I did a couple tours with him and he was just genuinely, you know, he was one of those guys that he gave me he gave me a, a lot of nice hugs and just encouraged me yeah. and said, you know, I, you know, just do your thing, you know, and and then but but then he would he would disappear. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, that's that was and the, and the and the tour promoter would be going, "Where's my check?" And, you know, and, and, and it was like, "We don't know, <laughs> we don't know." We saw him with a couple of girls walking that way. And <laughs> yeah, man, that's crazy. He was uh, because he recorded Hotel California and, and Hey Joe on one of his albums. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah, yeah. and that's, that's hey so Joe. I'm, I'm, I'm excited to hear that version. That's gonna be cool. Yeah, yeah. We we, we recorded in Jamaica with Sly Dunbar. Uh, so that'll, uh, you know, it it, uh, it was an amazing thing to see him work and just be in the studio with him. We had recorded with him before, but I wasn't in the studio. He was on Caribbean Blue. Nice. And uh, and to be able to see the way he ran, he did not say a word. His band, they just they were communicating. And he and it, it was so interesting because I was in the control room. He was the only one that was in the in the, the you know, the the isolation booth doing his thing and everybody was kind of talking and every they were all paying attention to him and going okay uh, and then somebody said that's one two three and the priest and the whole band was okay four <laughs> and then two, three, two, two, and they all came in and they're like whoa look at the way these guys are doing it they're legit Jamaica man you, you know, recording that, I, and that was a dream that I got to realize. I always wanted to record a, a record in Jamaica, kind of do my a record that I never really got to do when I was on the major labels because it was always a big fight, and yeah. they wanted us to do this, and they would put me with this producer and this songwriter, and it was like, you know, stuff that I appreciate now, but I just didn't understand at the time. Yeah, yeah. Wow. Oh. Uh, there's a lot of things in my life that are like that. <laughs> you know, you know what point. I'm talking about. Yeah, man. You know what I'm talking about, man. It's uh, you know, it's it it's 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 well, fortunately, hey, two guys, two guys from uh, the neighborhoods of San Diego. Yeah, and we're still doing it. And I wish you the best, Peter. I got you. Same back to you. I can't wait to see you again. Yeah. Uh, hear the new music. Oh, you know what? I didn't even give to that. Uh, give uh much advice but uh you know one of the things for musicians that's becoming guitarists at least is um the issue with the guitar you know do you take a hard case or do you take a soft case okay. um it's it's a big problem it's a big problem because um they uh you know the the the, the a lot of times they don't want you to take it up up in, in the plane on the plane yeah and you can't you can't gate check it with a soft case so i i switched to a hard case but now i'm paranoid that they're gonna lose it right so it's like not having it on my person or they're gonna be throwing it around and yeah and because so like, oh, it's in a hard case it'll be that's fine. something that and so that's like you know that's something that's that's ongoing i mean we need to get we need to get some sort of of uniformity in the airline industry that they have to start respecting musical <laughs> artists because we can't you yeah. know this is this is my baby right and, and and i love my guitar and god if anything happened and if they lost it oh my god so i just you know when i check it in i pray <laughs> to the universe you know you gotta get the it. little you I'm gotta get that it. little um CarPlay thing or what I don't know what it is a little tracker thing you can put inside your case so you can find you you'll know where it is at all times. That's a great I didn't even think about that. Yeah, 
And it'll be real close on your phone. So even if they do lose it, you'll be able to say, hey, it's in London right now. I didn't even think about that. Yeah, and, and you can hide well, that see, thing too, so they can't take it out. Man, well, see, your 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 show is 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 already uh, producing fruit, at least in my life. That's all that matters to me. You're good to go, bro. <laughs> <laughs> thank you for that advice, my friend. Hey, thank you so much for spending the time. I really, really, truly yeah. Appreciate it, man. And those of you who travel around, you know, try to travel. Jeez. Don't, 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 don't be the ignorant American. Yeah. You know, yeah. Keep. Recognize, recognize that we have so much to learn. People around the world are going to teach you so much. Yeah. Go in with an open mind and, you know, it, it, like a child, ready to learn. Try, you know, try to be respectful. Um, innocent, um, appreciative, you know, open-minded and, yeah. and be patient, be patient. Yeah. Um, you know, the rest of the world stands in line for everything, <laughs> yeah. you know, get it's yourself a, trip, a pair of headphones, get yourself a nice little audio book and stand in line and just, and just wait like the rest of the world. Yeah. Don't, you, you know, you don't, you don't have to be in the pre-check, uh, global, whatever, entry uh fast mode all the time right you know we as americans we we seem to think that we deserve something more than the rest of the world and it's just not true we don't deserve anything more than anybody else no. in this world and you know accept accept the fact and, and 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 be a good representative be a good american be a good representative of our country yeah well spoken man thank you thanks for the words yeah, I, I I will definitely see you in concert and pick up some more of your music. So thank you again. Well, keep in touch. Keep in touch, brother. Keep in touch. I'll we'll we'll go have a a little coffee or yeah, well, yeah. I'll, I'll be I'll be in touch with you. I'll be in touch with you about about some boots. I need I have some black boots, but I need some I need some brown boots. You need to get some browns. There you go. I'll yeah. You yeah, yeah. Thank you, brother. All right, bro. Thank you. <laughs>